So my name is Fiona, and today I'm going to share an opera that I worked on that includes live performance with electronic fixed media interludes. So just a little about me, I am born and raised in the Bay Area. I went to Mills College for piano performance and mixed media, so like electronic music, video, um, sound art, stuff like that. And as soon as I graduated, I actually got into film scoring, and that's kind of, it kind of just uh, took over my life after that. But I began kind of composing more seriously uh, in 2016, and that's kind of when I started composing music just for the sake of music, instead of, you know, doing music for a film. So these are a few of my influences, musical influences. You know, I'm really big into Keith Jarrett, Cecil Taylor, Beethoven, Gets Bach, Bartok, Stravinsky, Arvo Kurtz, um, Toro Takamitsu, Kalevi Aho, who I met in Finland, uh, Meredith Monk, uh, she's a singer, choreographer, filmmaker, Brian Eno, uh, David Bowie, Terry Riley, Bjorn, Apex Twin, Robert Ashley, Pan Dunn, Dead Can Dance, New Order, Bauhaus, Frank Zappa, and Plastic Man. So this is a quote that uh, was said by Sariano. She's a fin Finnish composer. I was not especially enthusiastic about opera when I was young, and I thought I would never write one. I felt it was an art form of the past, um, with expensive singers exposing their high notes and uh, theater and ridiculous stories which don't concern us. But then little by little, I realized it could be defined very differently that, on the contrary, opera can be something profound and not superficial, a wonderful meeting point of all the other arts. This is a photo of when I drove up from Iceland, from Reykjavik up to Isafjord two summers ago. I actually applied for a composer residency, and I didn't think I would get it, and I just was like, oh, I'm just gonna maybe do a project on my mom's story of her growing up in China uh, during the 1950s and her hardships that she had to face in order to kind of survive. Um, and also being a multi-ethnic individual, I wanted to kind of uh, do research. I was kind of you know, thirsty to learn more about my ancestral history. Uh, and I think writing this opera, researching it, would help me do that. So I actually spent two months in Iceland, up in Eastern Fjord, working on this libretto. Libretto is like a script, uh, like a film has a script. Libretto is like a storyline. And I worked on composing the music. It was amazing. I was, you know, put up in a music school all by myself. It was just me, the piano in the mountains, no distractions, no internet. And my laptop actually ended up breaking down the first week I was there. So I did everything by hand at first. I highly recommend it though. <laughs> I, I, got, I was very productive. So this is kind of a little about uh, the story of Wu Wei. And it's modeled after my mom's story. So Wu Wei kind of represents the daughter. She, she represents my mom in, in this libretto. Um, so it's a condensed single act English language chamber opera reflecting my mother's struggle to survive under the Mao regime in the 1950s in China. So during this period of civil strife, millions died due to uh, violent class warfare. So this is what preceded the Cultural Revolution in China, if, if any of you guys know about that. And the opera weaves a tapestry of personal political events following the life of Wu Wei, who is the daughter, and her mother, Mei. Wu Wei's father was a scholar, a Buddhist, and also he owned land, so that meant they were targets of the Mao regime. So in, throughout the story, it's like they transcend the hardships of losing, you know, Wu Wei loses her father, her home, and all the belongings, and through this period of heartbreaking loss, she has to persevere and carry forward hope that she'll then, you know, impart upon future generations. So I was kind of interested in composing works, you know, about my ancestral background, just because it helped me learn more about my own self. And this opera was unstaged. There was not enough funding to put on, you know, to, to stage it and everything, but maybe in the future. So this is kind of like an overview of what I'll talk about. Uh, family history, 
why did I choose opera, and a few influential operas and films that inspired the piece. And then I'm going to do like an analysis. I won't go into depth, it'll just be kind of like an overview. And also, you know, the structure, the compositional structure and process notes, and then conclusion, and then I'll answer any questions if you guys have any. So yeah, this is part A, family history, why opera, uh, and influential operas and films. So basically, my mom was born in 1951 in China to, into a wealthy family. Her father was a scholar. He owned land, and he was also a religious and Buddhist. And you know, during the communist regime, it was pretty much you know you, you couldn't do any of those were, were like put you at target for um, having everything taken away. Um, so and they're also China's having many problems just financially, so it was kind of like, you know, we're going to take away from anyone who has more than anyone else. Uh, millions of people were persecuted and experienced public humiliation, imprisonment, hard labor, and torture, harassment, seizure of property, and execution. Uh, and he felt that Mao, the, the leader of this regime, felt that that was necessary. He was to basically, instead of helping, you know, everyone else that, would, that needed more, it was just like take from each other, steal from each other, we're going to punish, it was, it was pretty awful. Even like teachers were, you know, during the Cultural Revolution, this is a little bit later, the students would actually, you know, do harm to the teachers and stuff like that. It was, it was pretty messed up and, you know, all the monasteries that you see in China were actually uh, destroyed. And so the ones that are there now have been rebuilt because they were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. So this is just kind of more information. This is commune life in the 1950s. Everything's kind of shared. Everyone kind of eats in the same area. So I chose to set my family's history in the context of opera because it encompassed all my interests into one medium. Um, you know, it can be, operas are usually really expensive to produce. And if you've ever been to an opera, you probably spend lots of money to go to one. Uh, it's usually, an, you know, it's usually for an exclusive club of people who, you know, the ones that can afford to go. But there are actually new collective groups such as Experiments in Opera and Goat Hall Productions that have focused on rewriting the story of opera in the 21st century so it doesn't have to be so costly. And so they've actually changed how contemporary operas are brought to life with limited resources. You know, most of the operas, if you go to the Opera House, are going to be Mozart, Beethoven and Wagner, you know, it's rare that you'll hear an opera by a living composer. And I was actually fortunate enough when I was in Finland, because I went to Finland before I went to Iceland uh, with a friend, and we went to see, we went to this opera house, and they were just playing every night just a new opera by a living composer. It was quite amazing. But Finland is one of those countries that produces more operas by living composers than any other country in the world. So, I think by having these other collective groups that are kind of reinventing opera, it's, it's showing that opera is a possible art form if you don't have that much funding. So I wanted to be part of this. So these are kind of some influence, influential people and operas that um, kind of influenced my opera. So Robert Ashley on the top, and then there's Meredith Monk. And we kind of talked about or we talked about Robert Ashley, um, his kind of opera for television and how he started using speech as music. And his whole mold was, um, thing was to, to make opera more accessible to more people. And this technique was actually directly influenced by a film, Hiroshima Mon Amour, directed by Elaine Rusnais. And this kind of, in this film, he actually uses highly structured repetitive dialogue in and out of non-diegetic music, which kind of creates it's like the, the talking creates like a soundtrack in the film. So Robert Ashley, you know, he decided to use the word opera even though he didn't like that word, but he wanted to incorporate electronics, spoken dialogue, chanting, mumbling, and vocalizing in a style that simulated speech. He believed that music was, or he believed that speech was music, and the melody of speech patterns could be written down and performed. Um, and then there's Meredith Monk on the bottom. And she actually used a lot of non-traditional singing techniques and non-verbal texts in her operas. She's very innovative in using texture of the voice. So 
So she actually saw the texture of the voice as being more important than the libretto or the script of the opera. And she would work across disciplines. She was a filmmaker, choreographer, vocalist. Um, and her first opera, or her, the opera that uh, was premiered, let's see, it was premiered in 91 at the Houston Grand Opera House. Her singers used a lot of extended vocal techniques, glottal effects, yodeling, ululation, animal sounds, speech sound, uh, nonverbal text. So each performer was actually required to learn all the parts in the opera just in case she made changes to the music. And she always stressed the, the importance of texture and uniqueness of the voice over the libretto. Because, you know, this is kind of groundbreaking because most operas are based off of the libretto. That's kind of the main driving force in the music. And she would often choose the voice or the character, a person's character, uh, for the part rather than like, oh, I need a soprano or an alto. And so Atlas, this is, this is the opera that she worked on. It's kind of a symbol for a spiritual quest and a vow to inner vision. So it focuses on a female explorer, Alexandra Daniels, and how she kind of goes on all these adventures, meets all these spirit guides, and kind of grapples with her own personal demons. And she works with higher spirits to help her kind of reconnect kind of to this more divine realm. And so her opera inspired my opera because it brought together so many different art forms into one piece. And a lot of her uh, vocal kind of extended techniques, I used some of those same techniques in a lot of my interludes, my electronic interlude where I recorded different sounds, kind of screeches, uh, kind of different uh, glottal stuff, and just kind of using my voice as an instrument. And Robert Ashley, uh, this is an opera that uh, the old man lives in concrete. This opera was kind of cool. It's, it's different from Perfect Lives, and it kind of emulates an old man who spends a lot of time by himself. So it kind of takes form of different thoughts that show up. There's also a lot of, he uses kind of electronic music during the talking, and so it kind of creates this, this very layered effect. So he kind of encouraged me to use voice with electronics, not in the same way that he used them. I actually don't use any text in my opera during the interludes, but um, you know, I use a lot of you know, breathing sounds, kind of crying sounds, gong scraping, and so I have this like, you know, very intimate kind of sound of my voice, but I'm also using um, kind of percussive instruments as well. So yeah, actually this method of kind of weaving stories between characters inspired me to do something similar, but without the words. Um, and then, also films were very important. I've, I've watched a lot of um, films by Chinese directors just to kind of give me an idea of how they kind of, um, the context of, of, of story and how the characters would interact and create a really powerful storyline that would kind of pull a viewer in. So the two films I kind of, that were very influential in helping me write the libretto were um, Zane Your Mouth's To Live and Tian Zhuang Zhuang's The Blue Kite. So these are kind of two films that were made that kind of centered around the, the mid 20th century in China and explored very sensitive uh, subjects, kind of cultural revolution and kind of uh, The Blue Kite was kind of based in the 1950s in China. So I always thought film was like one of the most powerful mediums for, for uh, kind of telling a story. And a lot of Asian families, you know, can kind of uh, view, they view their turmoil, their turmoil and the challenges they had to overcome as things that have really shaped their character and made them who they are today. So for example, this film, has anyone seen this film, by the way, To Live? Okay, yeah, it's an amazing film. It's, I always, it always makes me cry every time I watch it. So I wanted my libretto to kind of embody the same familial connection as the Fugai family. Um, it's not a perfect family, and it's, they're, they're more on the peasant side um, during, during the Cultural Revolution, but they had a, um, one of the biggest hardships in my opera the daughter had to overcome was kind of the death of her father and also of her mother. And in this film, it's, it's I don't want to give it away, but there's a lot of familial deaths that kind of make it really hard. Um, 
And so it's like the obstacle that they had to constantly overcome. It was just like, wow, it just keeps getting worse and worse. But how do they, you know, keep going? That's, you know, it's like the whole thing is called, it's called to live. It's like no matter how hard it gets, it's like, you know, they just keep going on. And the soundtrack was, was you know, very, very sparse and used kind of uh, traditional Chinese elements. And also the use of lighting. I just thought the lighting was, was pretty powerful. There's a part in the film where, where the, the, you know something bad is going to happen or there's going to be bad news and there's just a single you know, yellowish light that kind of, you can see the person's face uh, of a truck driver who has to you know, come to terms with the fact that he's killed someone, he accidentally hit someone and they're, and they're no longer here. And just the lighting gives a lot of information about what's going on with the characters and the story. And, I actually used lighting quite a bit in my in the opera, um, and also the blue kite was was also powerful. Uh, this is an Orson Welles quote: "The camera is much more than the recording apparatus. It is a medium via which messages reach us from another world that is not ours, and that brings us to the heart of a great secret. Here, magic begins." You know, always I always thought that like watching films was kind of like a way to time travel. You, know, you can get so immersed in the story. Um, so that's what I wanted to you know create the song. So that's to live. Um, song narrative, minimal soundtrack lighting, and then the blue kite. This is in the I highly recommend these films. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about the compositional structure and process notes of the piece, and I'm going to do an overview. There's seven scenes, a total of seven scenes for the whole opera, and it's a single act opera, so there are no uh, stage changes, everything is just lights up, lights down, lights up, lights down, kind of a thing. Yeah, so I want to combine my passion for storytelling in a cinematic manner, so using electronics, um, electronic mirror moods, plus, you know, traditional notated score, and I wanted the narrative to have like a continuous flow, kind of like that of a film soundtrack. Um, so I kind of use these electronic interludes to kind of bridge the different live performance areas to kind of just keep the audience immersed. You know, sometimes when you hear a piece and there's one movement and then people start clapping and then there's another movement, and it, and it kind of breaks the flow. So I wanted it to just be continuous. Um, so a lot of these fixed media interludes, you know, combine pre-recorded sound, sampling, signal processing, synthesis, and diffusion in the speakers, which would crossfade. It was a, a 7.1 uh, sound system at Eagle College where it was performed, so I could kind of play around with kind of diffusing the sound in different areas of the room to kind of really create an immersive process. Um, and I also use transitions. I use, I use lighting to really help the transition. So, you know, a blue light would come up and then the piece would begin and then the blue lights would fade down and then the stage lights would fade up and that would kind of signal the performers when to start playing the next aria. So it was kind of a, it was like a, I was a conductor. I felt like I had to cue the lighting person. I had to cue the, the conductor. You know, it's just like it all kind of, I felt like everything was barely hanging on. Like if I messed up one thing, it would all come, come apart. Okay, so these are the total the seven the seven scenes. Um, it begins with the loom, which is a fixed media piece, a prologue, which is a live performance, Fred Skeletons, which is an interlude, Sound of Death, which is a live performance, the aftermath, electronic interlude, the mother's death, which is a live performance, and then angelic conversation, which is kind of an electronic coda. Do this. I'm just going to play a little bit of it so you can kind of um, hear it. I should really talk a little before I play. Uh, so the womb, it's an electroacoustic fixed media piece and it featured contact microphone recordings that I did um, using water, wine glasses, carbonated water, tapping on glass, and air bubbles which were processed in Ableton Live using various equalization parameters, filter sweeps, delays, and reverbs. So this piece kind of represents Wu Wei, who's the daughter, um, the unborn child who is kind of floating in the womb of her mother in this space, protected from the outside world. So this feeling of safety is, is very short because it soon changes 
um, during the second half of the piece. And I wanted to limit myself to using only a few sound sources that were transparent enough to recognize. So it kind of begins, you know, using wine glass samples that I pitched and layered, creating perfect and imperfect intervals. And I wanted to just create this rich palette of tones uh, that created a harmony consisting, you know, consonant and then dissonant intervallic ratios. So just basically intervals that sound pretty together and then intervals that sound more and more dissonant as it went through. And I took advantage, you know, of the 7.1 channel sound system and just kind of through trial and error, just kind of experimented, routing different things, panning certain um, sound sources so that they would kind of travel in space. So I kind of use this a lot, this, the, the whole, um, this technique of diffusion, I use it quite a bit in a lot of these interludes. Um, so let me play this. I'll play a little bit. Three of Lou Harrison's trainees, Tom Toms, Tam Tam, uh, Marimba, and Flexitone. So it was fully notated and began as a four part choral piece sung by the main singers Wu Wei, the daughter, the mother, the father, and also the, the maid. So this piece kind of sets the energy of the story. It kind of has that kind of Baroque feeling of kind of like a sacred, it's a sacred piece, you know, just kind of with a Buddhist chant that I put it with. And towards kind of the center of the piece, it starts to kind of this is where kind of the soldiers start to come in and start chanting, you know, down with, down with traitors, down with traitors. And so it kind of changes the energy of the piece so it becomes hostile and dissonant filled, uh, mixed with uh, vocal clusters, chromatic triplets, vocal sirens, 
and then there's a, a short pause, and then there's a climactic kind of six-speed blood-curdling scream by the entire ensemble, and then the lights fade after that. This is either the two pages of the score. And this is another electronic interlude. It proceeds immediately after the blackout. So this fixed media piece introduces more chaos into the mix, um, which kind of foreshadows the impending attack on Wu Wei's family. So I use source recordings of my voice, prepared piano, various struck and bowed metals, as well as a plexitone. I, I built a, um, a phaser object in MaxMSP. And basically, I just want to create the illusion that there was a shift and there's no sense of stability or foundation. And I just um, routed these various sound objects to a different seven channel system to create kind of a spatial dance between the different sound sources. So my aim was to kind of position um, each object so that it fully immersed the listener. Um, and you know, I, I created, uh, or I, I wish I would have taken photos of myself doing this or filmed it at least uh, when I was Kind of striking various objects, you know, throwing golf balls in, into the piano, uh, metal chopsticks, rocks, using a Super Bowl mallet on the strings on a piano, um, and then just exciting these sounds through various processors, pitch changers, delays, reverbs, and then warping these clips in Ableton Live um, to also make them more melodic rather than just um, textural <coughs> and rhythmic. And I also sampled my voice. Uh, it created kind of a bunch of tone clusters using the MIDI controller, uh, so they helped kind of create a very schizophrenic nature of the piece. So.
So I figure it's recorded hand cranked sirens, uh, voices, breathing sounds, crying, prepared piano, bow to strike percussion, and a few electronic drones. So the piece is very heavy and dark and um, evolves to a sparser texture with kind of points of, of uh, trauma and shock. And I use that, I use the plexitone as kind of like a, a symbol of like things are kind of getting out of hand and, and not um, going well. And so I use pitches of several hand crank sirens to kind of, you know, and changing the speed of the siren kind of changes the pitch, pitches of the sounds and recorded them. And also used, you know, bowing and super ball mallets to kind of scrape a tam-tam, which is a large gong. Um, so the combined sounds create kind of a new complex kind of texture. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of moves in, in physical space. We don't have a 7.1 sound system here, so you can't... actually do. Oh, you do? Not, okay. It's not set up. We it's not set, set up, up, but... So it's kind of, it's a, it's a different experience hearing it in stereo, but... Um, and then I also recorded myself kind of vocal cries and kind of shrieks and stuff like that. And this is what, you know, Meredith Monk inspired me uh, with, with her extended vocal techniques. So I kind of do something similar. It was hard to try to make myself cry while recording myself, but, you know, I, I did that. And, you know, finding a balance between all these different sounds because it's, it's just a lot of things going on at once. So I had to route things um, to different speakers to make it all fit.
So then right after that, the last electronic coda fades in. So this depicts the end of the story where Wu Wei is left on her own to struggle with accepting her fate. So this piece is about letting go, and I wanted the piece to be ethereal to kind of symbolize the spirit realm as Wu Wei kind of opens herself to receiving higher guidance. So she's kind of grieving the loss of both her parents, uh, yet is trying to find strength, strength within. And so Angelic Conversations, it's a soundscape kind of featuring sampled whirlies, which are those long tubes that you can, sound hoses that you can twirl. I don't know if they still make them anymore. And so I layered a bunch of those and also did a bunch of pitch shifting to kind of create these consonant intervals that went out in, in and out of phase with each other. And I wanted to explore the pitch noise continuum in this piece, so I mix in some vinyl distortion and some kind of water drops I recorded to kind of give it more texture and crunch because there's all this ethereal stuff. I needed something to kind of ground it as well. So there's a lot of canonic figures, just, you know, where one pattern kind of passes, the same pattern passes to another, um, and kind of uh, back and forth of, of these different kind of fragments. And so I mixed uh, the vocal tracks and actually projected them through the, we, have a, we had a center speaker that was kind of, you know, because I wanted it to be kind of like angels kind of singing to you, like a choir of angels. So I projected that from the top speaker while everything else was the front two speakers for all the really sounds and all the textural sounds.
so yeah, the, the texture and kind of like what, what sounds I use. I know that the, the percussive stuff was definitely for more of the soldiers, and I wanted that, it had more of that chaotic kind of earthly feel, whereas the, the family, the Wu Wei family, was more strings and kind of um, the more ambient stuff. So I kind of chose stuff based on like, you know, from soldier sounds, you know, using more percussive stuff, stuff that's more metals and stuff, and then for the, um, the ambient stuff, like the whirlies and the wine glasses and voice and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Yeah, I actually, when I was in Iceland, I worked on my libretto first. I had an idea for the music, but I, I needed the story. I think that's just, just like a film, like my background in film composing, I always had a script before, and you know, I always did the spotting with the director just to kind of, what kind of music goes here, what kind of music goes here. So yeah, it was, I was more traditional in that sense where I used the libretto. Uh, having a deadline helps kind of speed up the creative process. I actually spent the most time probably writing the Mother's Death aria, um, and also the Womb, which is the first electronic interlude. So deadlines can help, but yeah, there were times where I was just like, I don't know what to do, and it's just like you're trying to crank out so much music, and I'm like, does it all sound the same? <laughs> like I can't. So I think just, yeah, there were definitely times that just having that deadline was just like, I can't make excuses, I just have to do something. That was challenging. For the electronic interludes, did you like compose each one from like the beginning to the end? Like did you record all the sounds and do them all like one at a time? Or did you kind of just like record a bunch of stuff and then like put each one together later? Yeah, so I actually recorded a bunch of stuff. So for each interlude, I had like an idea of like what I wanted to create. Like the first one was like, I want it to be watery, ambient, ethereal, so I kind of stuck to, I just recorded like like a lot of sounds, and then later I just kind of picked and choose what I wanted and discarded the rest. But yeah, I did that for each interlude where I had like a specific recording session. Cool. Each one. All right, is that it? Okay, yeah, and if you wanna, if you wanna see the whole opera, you can go on to my YouTube or any of these platforms on social media. I have recordings of it, and then you can see the full video on, on YouTube. So thank you for sticking around. Thank you.